Um, thanks to Tom. Thanks to Fowl, our friends of the Waccamaw Library. I see uh, Dee Phillips, uh, Vice President of Fowl, right here up front. Um, so we really appreciate uh, our friends. If you're not a member of our friends, please join up. Uh, we have you sign up right in the, the Friends Center, uh, and they have a lot of sales going on uh, right here, which is uh, even better than usual because you can get pick up a nice uh, nice book, puzzles for next to nothing typically, and now they have holiday sales, uh, so you can. Uh, you, it's almost like they're paying you to go get a, a nice book, a nice hardback uh, book or some other items, jewelry, whatever, over in the, uh, the Friends Center right across the way. But you can go sign up, become a friend, uh, get involved uh, with volunteer projects here at the library. So we really appreciate our friends. They keep us going, and they make this first ser Thursday series possible. Um, so this, is, this concludes our... Uh, 2022 uh, series today, and we'll start back in January. We will have a, a January session uh, on January 5th uh, over the break. Uh, and as you leave, you can, you know, if you have your phone, you can take a click a picture uh, of the uh, the poster board out there uh, that has the spring schedule already planned. Um, and today we're we're honored to have uh, Dr. Sarah Rich. Uh, from up the road a little, a little bit uh, in Horry County. Uh, she's at Coastal Carolina University, um, but she's uh, taking us out today with a very interesting uh, topic, mushrooms. Uh, Tom had some, he was peppering uh, us with some comments as he was playing about his experiences with mushrooms. Uh, not not a, a, a scholarly approach uh, as Dr. Rich uh, has, has approached this, this topic with. with. Uh, but Dr. Rich is an art historian and maritime archeologist who dabbles in wood science, studio art, and speculative fiction. Uh, she is author of four books on uh, quite an array of topics. So this is kind of paper thin, but you'll see the kind of the heft of, of all she explores. Her first book, Cedar Forest, Cedar Ships, Allure, Lore, and Metaphor in the Mediterranean Near East, explores the complex relationships between ancient shipbuilding and forests that supplied the ship's timbers. Her next book, Shipwreck Hauntography, Underwater Ruins and the Uncanny, uncovers links between art and underwater archaeology. So when she's not out foraging in the woods for mushrooms, <laughs> she's deep diving into you know, ancient shipwrecks, or uh, she's doing some pre-Civil War shipwrecks off the coast of Charleston. Uh, so she's, she's pretty adventurous, to say the least, uh, and then writes about it. Uh, so that book uncovers links between art and underwater archaeology. Uh, she's also published a book of creative nonfiction, Closer to Dust, in her spare time. Uh, and today she's here to talk about her brand new book, or, or is it coming? Is it, it's coming, it's almost brand new, but it's, it's soon to be hot off the press, uh, the aptly and engagingly titled Mushroom, uh, in which she will share the hidden power of mushrooms and how these overlooked fungi contribute vitally to a healthy ecology as well as to a healthy human psychology. Uh, and we also have uh, Jeremy, her, uh, I won't say better half, her, her equal half. They're equally good. Uh, also a, a PhD, uh, you know, so, and he's a, uh, a philosopher. So, that, you know, very, very bright household there. So we'll have to have them both uh, come back and see us again and talk on some other topics. Uh, and they also have a couple of dogs uh, at, that they take care of as well. Kima and Nanook, that I want to give some, some credit to as well. Um, but so let's, let's please welcome uh, Dr. Sarah Rich into our midst today and, and hear all about mushrooms. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for that warm um, 
uh, introduction. And um, yeah, it's, this is a, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, I, I have to say that I, I've never given a talk on mushrooms before, so we'll see how this goes. It could be a once in a lifetime experience for you guys. If this is a total flop, I might never do it again. So uh, let's hope it's not that, though. Um, but yes, yeah, so as Dan said, uh, normally I speak about shipwrecks um, or about wood science. Um, uh, usually, uh, sometimes pr um, submerged prehistoric landscapes, too. Um, but uh, I've decided to sort of venture off into, uh, into a different part of my research, which has more to do with forest ecology and looking at, at mushrooms and um, I've, I've long been a forager my whole life. My, you know, I grew up in a, in a foraging family um, out in rural Kansas, uh, where morel hunting every spring was kind of like that was like the big thing. You know, we would go into the into the horse pasture and look for morels, and we had our you know like brown paper grocery bags from Ray's IGA that we would like you know fill full of uh, full of morels and then bring them back home. And just like the smell of this is like of those of those mushrooms cooking is like the smell of my childhood. Um, I've foraged also um, a lot uh, as, I, um, as I grew you know, older and entered graduate school. And those of you who have uh, experienced the poverty of being a student for you know, 10, 15 years at a time, this, uh, this may resonate with you a little bit. Um, the foraging adventures sort of became um, not so much like a part of tradition, but a part of you know, sort of survival and like actually having a, a meal. Um, so, I feel like a sort of a, a debt of gratitude to these, um, these beings. Um, but not everyone is on the same page as me. Um, and so that's what we're going to kind of explore in this talk. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about how I came to this, uh, th this topic, um, but also about the book itself, um, which, uh, as Dan mentioned, is coming out on uh, January 12th. And, um, and I'll give you a couple like little sneak peeks um, as, as to uh, what the book talks about and, and how, and also why. So to get us started, I have a, this, is a, this talk is going to be a little bit more interactive maybe than some of the, uh, some of the other things that um, we typically do in these kinds of settings. But I wanted you guys to just sort of like list off what are some things that come to mind when you think about mushrooms? Like what are some, some words or even some synonyms that, that come to mind when you hear the word mushroom? Soup. Soup, okay, good, good. What else? Alfredo. Alfredo, okay. Pizza. Have you guys eaten yet today? Because I feel like maybe we need to get some breakfast in here. All right, what else? Okay, psilocybin, there we go, all right. What about some adjectives that you would use to describe a mushroom? Delicious and dangerous. Okay, all right, delicious and dangerous. This is, this is good, all right, what else? Slippery, slimy, brown, small, weird, maybe. These kinds of things often come to mind, I think. Um, and we're talking about mushrooms, but, uh, but definitely that, that dichotomy of delicious on the one hand and dangerous on the other is, is really important, right? Um, we, uh, mushrooms kind of bring about a, a, sense of, um, a sense of hesitancy, to say the least, um, with most people, where you know, we might you know, kind of admire them for, their, um, you know, for certain properties, but at the same time, they're kind of spooky in a way because you know that some of them can kill you. Um, some of them have, have toxins that, uh, you know, that, that um, make, you know, that, that make uh, like the worst poisonings that you can imagine seem like a preferable way of, uh, way of death. Um, some of them, you know, not, not the mushrooms that, uh, you know, that we see around here, but there are mushrooms that grow in other parts of the world that, um, that can enter into an animal's body, into an animal's nervous system and control them like a puppet. Um, it is, they're, they're very bizarre beings, and of course, they're, the, the mushroom itself is just the fruiting body of the fungus, right? The fungus is the actual organism, and of course, when we hear the word fungus, we think of all kinds of terrible things, right? Like, all, all kinds of sort of, you know, fungal infections and, uh, um, you know, the fungus that eats away the, the floor timbers of your house. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about my own personal experience here, but, uh, you know, up in Conway, you know, lots of fungus in those floors. Um, so... Uh, you know, suffice it to say that we have a, a sort of love-hate relationship, I think, with, um, with, with mushrooms in many ways. 
And you know, like as you all mentioned, um, uh, we know that mushrooms are really valuable for culinary purposes, um, especially those of us who who, uh, who don't eat meat or much meat. You know, mushrooms make a great substitute for uh, for uh, things like steak and burgers and, and uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, they're I think there, there's kind of a trend going on right now. I don't know if anybody else has noticed this, but we now have like mushroom coffee, and um, uh, mushrooms are sort of everywhere right now. And uh, a lot of this is, is because of their culinary purposes, but also because of the medicinal properties that mushrooms have. And uh, these medicinal properties are, are there, it seems like every day there's a new study that comes out that offers some new insight as to, um, you know, the, the sort of cancer uh, treating capabilities of, of a certain mushroom, or I mean, they will cure just about anything that ails you, not just your appetite, but also things like uh, things like the libido, uh, things like um, the immune system. Um, the list goes on and on. I mean, if you're having problems with fatigue, there's a mushroom out there that will help with this. And um, you know, a lot of the uh, the contemporary science is sort of supporting. Um, you know, like folk medicine that, that people have known about for hundreds, even thousands of years. Have you guys ever heard of the, um, the Iceman Otzi? He was the, the mummy that was found in the, in the Swiss Alps like several years, you know, several decades ago, in fact. Um, but he, this, this very well-preserved um, Bronze Age man um, trekked up into the Alps with numerous, uh, numerous ailments and wounds, and in his sort of... Uh, first aid kit, there were several mushrooms, and one of them was, uh, they, you know, has antiseptic properties, so we're talking about healing infections and, um, you know, soaking up, uh, soaking up infected blood and, and things like that. So uh, mushrooms have long been known uh, for their medicinal properties, and it seems that contemporary science is, is kind of just now getting up to speed with, um, you know, with all of the, the, uh, the values that mushrooms have in that department. But of course, we can't uh, forget aesthetic value too, right? Um, there are many mushrooms. Like this is a this is an amethyst deceiver, um, and I think you can see why. You know, because it, it looks a lot like an amethyst, right? Which is a, a, a crystal. Um, they are m many mushrooms are are in fact just astoundingly beautiful, but some of them are also wildly disgusting. Um, there is a mushroom that grows, <laughs> uh, that I first encountered when I lived in Belgium, which is where I got my PhD, but it looks sort of like a soccer ball, but it's red and hollow in the middle, and it just it looks like a sort of web. And we have a variation of this that grows here in South Carolina. In fact, we had some in our backyard, here, like two, uh, two springs in a row, and they smell like carrion, like dead animals, and that's how they reproduce. They attract, they have this aroma of rotting meat, and they attract flies that way, and then the flies pick up the spores, and then they go around and land on others, and that's, that's how, they, how they make babies. So um, their, their aesthetic values are, are again, sort of far-ranging, and just like with the medicinal properties, some of them will heal you, others will kill you. Um, with the aesthetic values, some of them are astoundingly beautiful, and others are, are quite, uh, quite revolting. Um, but you know, but they, that is a, an important value that, uh, that they have. And I've even heard stories of people making mushroom bouquets, which I would not recommend, because first of all, some of them, again, are poisonous, right? So if you are picking up a beautiful but poisonous mushroom, then you get it on your hands, and then you eat that delicious pizza that you were just talking about, and then all of a sudden you've ingested a bunch of toxins. But the other thing, of course, is that, um, is that the, like I said, the mushroom is really just the fruiting body of the, the organism itself, the fungus. And so this is, these are the reproductive organs of the, of the um, organism itself. Um, so if you remove the, the mushroom, and just use it for a bouquet, for instance, then you actually rob that organism its method of reproduction. And that kind of leads me into the, this final function of the, the ecological function, and that um, is, is arguably the most important one because we cannot have forests without mushrooms. Uh, the live oaks, the pines, the cypresses, all of these beautiful, magnificent trees that we have growing in this area are all reliant on the mycelial networks underneath the ground. And uh, so that's, uh, like I said, the, you know, like the mushroom is the pretty part. This is the part that we see. But underneath that, deep into the, the, uh, the log where these little guys are growing, and, and underneath that moss, 
you would see little white filaments that grow into the ground, and they connect. They they form these sort of um, these sort of networks, um, and. It, in these networks, there is, um, there's actually information and nutrients and all of these things that sort of travel through the mycelium and, and allow for trees to grow. Um, there's a, a fun little idiom called the wood wide web that uh, the uh, forest ecologist in British Columbia, Suzanne Simard, has, uh, has come up with. It's not exactly accurate. Because when you think of the wood wide web, you know you think about just information being transferred through this uh, through this network, but that kind of sells the sells the network short in a way. Um, but we also have to understand that mushroom, you know, that mushrooms and, and the, the the fungal organisms that uh, they are just one part of are not exactly like you know some kind of Robin Hood who is just like sharing nutrients and making sure that everybody gets their equal shares. It's not a communist system after all. It's not a socialist. Uh, a socialist network um, of you know like robbing from rich nutrient nutrient rich trees to give to nutrient poor trees or something like that. Like they all have their own agendas. Some of them are are equal sharers. Others are others like to hoard. Others are parasites, right? But parasites also have important ecological roles. Um, you know you can't have an ecosystem even without uh, without parasites. So lots and lots of different kinds of lots lots of different values, and yet. Given all of this, we all know that mushrooms are commonly detested. Probably all of us in this room knows at least one person who thinks, who thinks that mushrooms are, are quite disgusting. I know one right there. <laughs> yep. I wrote this book for you, just so you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, they just kind of give you an icky feel. Just, you know, it's just an icky feel. It's not a... I think I think um, my husband's problem with mushrooms is really just that he doesn't uh, he doesn't he suspects that they're up to something and he doesn't know what it is, <laughs> and I think you're right about that. I <laughs> think they do know <laughs> that they are they are up to something, and sometimes you're right; it's no good. All right, so um, so this is the uh, the cover of, of the new book. Um, it is I brought a couple of um, of copies to to share with you guys of other volumes in this same series. Um, just so you can kind of get a sense of what the series is like, because it's a pretty cool, um, unique series, and um, each each book is very small, as you can see, and they have these beautiful, um, you know, these beautiful covers that the designer really puts a lot of effort into. Um, so it's been really been great working uh, working with the publisher and working with the series editors um, on this project. But um, each of the books in this series, called Object Lessons, which is published by Bloomsbury Press. Um, it focuses on one thing, as the, as the series would suggest, the series name would suggest, it's one object. And um, so these books range from like the ones that I'm passing around now, like dust, tree, ocean, um, waste. But there are also other things like high heel, sticker, <laughs> phone booth is one. So it's like any object that you could possibly imagine. And, and the book takes a sort of deep dive into um, the history of the object, the meaning of that object. Um, it's a kind of social or a, like a cultural um, appreciation for the things that make up our lives, the things that make up reality that we often pass by without, without giving much thought to. So um, I, I have long been a fan of this series. And so I, I knew that I wanted to write a book and when, uh, you know, for this series. And when COVID hit, I suddenly found myself with a, a second spring break. And uh, I was like, well, maybe now's the time to pitch a book. So of course, my fir the, f my, the first pitch was boat wreck, because that's what I typically write about. And I had a, a sort of idea in mind. And I had um, recently published an essay that, um, that was on that topic, and, and so I could use that as my sort of first chapter. They really liked it, but they decided that it was too close to what I always write about. And so they wanted me to kind of try something else. And so I pitched three more things, um, driftwood, eyeball and mushroom, and they liked mushroom the most. So as it turns out, one of the series editors um, is, is also a forager, so he was sort of partial to, uh, to that one. So um, as I mentioned, the book is, is uh, coming out um, on January 12th. Um, it, these books are, are also cheap, too. They're like $10, $15 or something like that, so they're totally affordable. But um, uh, and, and, and again, like if you don't like this this idea, I'm, I'm pitching the whole series here, not just uh, not just my volume, because there really is something for everyone. 
um, in the series, and they are all just very well written and well edited. Um, so with, uh, with mine, um, I kept it to four small parts. So there is a part dedicated to mystery, and that's one of the parts that I'm going to share with you guys today. Um, the second part is dedicated to metaphor, so how mushrooms and fungi compose these metaphors that, uh, that we live by. And then part three is mycology, so that's the more scientific part. Um, and then part four uh, goes into medicine. Um, and then part five is magic, and that is also the part that I'm going to share with you. Well, one small part uh, of that chapter that I'm going to share with you all today. <clears throat> All right, so mystery. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, the sort of working question for this, this entire research project was, why is it that we have this love-hate relationship with mushrooms? Why is it that, we, that mushrooms do all of these amazing things, and yet we so, are, you know, so commonly um, are, are really disgusted by them, or suspicious of them, at least, right, Jeremy? Um, so, as I was, you know, trying to find an answer to this question, I came across um, this image of the scala naturae, or the, the great chain of being. So this is actually a, um, a fairly recent work of art. It's a it's collage. Um, it was made in 1994 by American artist Mark Dion, and it's actually um, housed at the um, Emory University in the Emory University collections. So in this collage. It's like I said, it's a contemporary artwork, but it actually refers back to much more, a much more ancient um, set of ideas um, on this sort of concept of ordering all things in the world um, into a hierarchical relationship. At the top, of course, you have humans, right? And in particular, a, ter a certain type of human, a man, a white man. And above him, you can sort of imagine the divine realm. And in some of the Renaissance era examples, you can see this much more clearly, where you have like uh, the angels above the man, and then the god above the angels, and so forth. So there's a very clear sense of, of earthly hierarchy that is um, echoed in a, in a heavenly hierarchy as well. Now, below the man, of course, we have uh, animals that are sort of familiar to us, that, that we like, that we sort of see ourselves in, things uh, like vertebrates. Um, mammals in particular, like rabbits and um, you know, maybe birds. We all like birds, right? And then below that, you have kind of weirder things like fish and frogs. Uh, and below that, there, there are the even more strange things of crustaceans. And things, with things, once we start getting into the ocean, things get really weird, and uh, we don't like them quite so much. And so then below that, um, we have bugs. Of course, we've all killed bugs before, right? Don't really think much of it. And then below that, you have corals, starfish, shells. Um, these are lower organisms, right? Lower forms of life. We often use this in our daily speech without really thinking about where it comes from or why even we assume that other life forms are higher or lower than another. Um, below that, of course, we have plants, which are, um, you know, we, uh, you know we, everybody's pulled weeds before, too. Again, you don't think anything about it. And then below that, you have crystals and mushrooms. And then below that are inanimate objects. Why are the mushrooms so low on this scala naturae? Why are the mushrooms so low on the great ladder of being or the chain of being? Why would they be below plants? Why wouldn't they at least be on the same rung or you know, even maybe one higher? Or... So this is, uh, this is, again, it sort of like formed the, the big question that I started looking into. And so, um, if you go back into, into the Renaissance, which of course the Renaissance, the European Renaissance, the Enlightenment, has informed a lot of our contemporary thinking. Um, and Francis Bacon, um, who is a famous, I guess you would say, philosopher, um, he wrote a book called Silva Silvarum in 1617, where he referred to mushrooms as imperfect plants. Now this is already, um, he's already drawing on Aristotle, the, the Greek philosopher, uh, who wrote uh, De Anima, On the Soul, um, in 350 BC, who had already organized like three big groups of life, right? Where you have human, the anthropos, at the top, of course. And then below that, you have animal life, or zoon. And then below that, you have plant life, or photon. And so 
you have these, these three rungs of the ladder, these three steps of the, of the staircase, uh, with humans at the top, animals in the middle, non-human animals in the middle, and then plants at the bottom. But Aristotle was a bit stumped about mushrooms. He was like, I kind of think they're, they're, they're plants, but maybe there's something else and somebody should look into the matter, but then no one ever did. Like nobody bothered to do that until the 1970s. So fungi and plant, so fungi have been considered a type of plant for thousands of years, and no one ever bothered to correct the categorization until um, botanists actually kind of figured this out finally and it separated botany from mycology in the 70s and then uh, in the 80s, it was really sort of solidified. What a strange natural history. Um, so, so now we have this sort of, um, you know, an idea of where this, uh, this, gr this great chain of being comes from and why we sort of order these, uh, these different organisms into this system of higher and, and lower beings, even though, of course, contemporary biologists would say that this is, this is nonsense, right? That, uh, that there's no such thing as a higher or lower organism. It's just different organisms. They all have different roles, different ecological roles. They all do different things, and they might be more simple or more complex, but not necessarily higher or lower. Um, and yet, you know, these things sort of stick in our minds. They stick in our, uh, in our sort of collective imaginary. So if Francis Bacon in 1670 is referring to mushrooms as imperfect plants, then he's saying that plants are here and mushrooms are below that, right? They're less perfect. And so now we have an idea of you know, where, this, where this comes from, this, uh, a part of, an inkling of an idea of why mushrooms are considered um, you know, so much lower than all other organisms. But I think there's more to the story than just that. So um, there is a, a very controversial theory that much of alchemical practice in Europe, in, uh, especially in the late Middle Ages, but also in the, in, in the Renaissance, uh, when it was still widely practiced, um, that alchemy had to do with, um, with mushrooms and particularly the really iconic one, the fly agaric, or the Amanita muscaria, which is the red one with white dots, right? We've all seen pictures of that one or um, Christmas decorations, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, I think that um, there is some truth to this, uh, to this claim. Um, but I think also that alchemy was a very, there's no one practice that was alchemy, right? So I think that when we're, when we're looking at alchemical manuscripts from this period um, and looking at the illustrations, which are intentionally esoteric, right? They're not supposed to be understood by everyone. There's a lot of decoding that we have to do to actually get towards some truth. But what caught my eye, this, this uh, couple of, of manuscript um, illustrations, which you can see here, they look very similar, but they're actually different, and they're, they're quite different in date. I think one, the top one is uh, from the 17th century, and the one from the bottom is from the 18th century. Uh, but they're both European. They're both uh, written in, in Latin. So in this, let me help you kind of break this down. So in these images, we have a flask that is, has this kind of bulbous base and then a crown a jeweled crown at the top. And inside this flask, this jeweled flask, we have an Ouroboros, which is a kind of a serpent or a dragon in this case, biting its own tail. And then below that, we have a horse that's upside down. And the horse um, has flames actually shooting out of, out of its hooves. And then below that, you have this sort of heap of something, right? Okay, and this is all very strange. Why is the horse upside down? What does the dragon have to do with the horse? What is the heap that the horse is lying on? And why is the flask crowned? Okay, so I think that um, when we look at the inscriptions that are written with these, then we start to get maybe an idea. Uh, and I think it starts to lead a little bit of credence to this, um, like I said, this controversial theory that associates alchemical practice with um, the fly agaric. So um, does anybody read Latin? Darn, okay, so you're gonna have to trust me uh, in my, uh, my um, translation here. That uh, the one at the top, you can see there's an inscription um, all the way at the top, and that one says, this is a painting of the container in which the freedom proper to humankind in wonder and not without joy shall be as he gazes upon some relative thing. So this is a strange, enigmatic inscription um, that seems to suggest that whatever is inside that flask can offer humankind a great, uh, can offer humankind a great amount of wonder and joy 
uh, some semblance of freedom. And there's something that he will see, something that he will gaze upon. Starting to get a sense of maybe a vision, maybe a hallucination, all right? Um, and then at the, uh, at the bottom, written on the horse's body itself in both of these images, it says, this is a philosophical drawing, namely of putrefaction. Now, if you know anything about alchemy, you know that putrefaction is a core principle that leads to purification. One cannot achieve purification without first going through a process of putrefaction. And what are mushrooms notorious for but growing on dead, rotting stuff, right? So I think that what we're seeing here, and we all know that uh, like the, uh, the like button mushrooms and the, the mushrooms that you buy at the grocery store, they're often grown on horse dung, right? And there are, um, there are poems and other inscriptions, not related uh, directly to these images, but other alchemical poems and inscriptions that talk about the role of horse manure. And so I think that what we're seeing in these images is an effort on the part of um, people practicing alchemy, um, alchemists, to actually harvest fly agaric, to, to uh, cultivate fly agaric and grow it for the purposes of hallucination. And of course, they're not the only ones who knew the, knew the properties of this particular mushroom. But I think it's especially interesting when we compare the shape of the flask to the mushroom itself. And I think you can see it especially in the, the second tallest one, the one that hasn't quite opened up yet. So um, the descriptions of this crowned jewel flask and also of the serpent inside the, the, uh, the flask often describe it as red or uh, red with white speckles or sometimes white with red speckles, red spots. Um, and the fly agaric grows out of this, this sack. It's called a vulva. Um, and it's kind of this bulbous sack at the base. And then it has this long straight shoot um, of, of the stalk before it opens up into this sort of like crown with, with little diamond-like jewels. Um, so I think the visual similarity is, is intriguing. And then combined with you know, the, the textual um, references and, and you know, the, the horse manure and all of these things kind of leads us to uh, some kind of idea that, that, you know, that, that uh, fly agaric was, an important, was indeed an important part of alchemical practice and maybe even um, you know, again, the efforts to cultivate it were at the heart of much alchemical practice. However, of course, you know, al alchemy was not um, in favor uh, for many of the religious authorities, but also the political authorities in Renaissance Europe. And so it was, again, very esoteric and sort of like underground, you know, kept underground. And, um, uh, you know, people were, people paid a high price for practicing alchemy in those days. And so I think this might be another reason why mushrooms have sort of been cast to the bottom of the, of the Scala Naturae and why we have that kind of like love-hate feeling uh, for them. <clears throat> but again, I think that there's more to the story even than, than just that. So, um, so carrying on with our, our mystery and sort of moving along in time, I think, uh, you know, the, the uh, bad reputation of the alchemist adds to the bad re re uh, reputation of the mushroom. Um, but that there are other things too. So um, I know Dan is a, is a poet. Um, you probably are very familiar with this, uh, with this poem. But um, in uh, The Sensitive Plant, and of course, again, plants and mushrooms were considered the same in the, in the 19th century, um, Shelley wrote, uh, the, there's this one little, one stanza. He wrote, an agarics and fungi with mildew and mold started like mist from the wet ground cold, pale, fleshy, as if the decaying dead with a spirit of growth had been animated. So we're clearly seeing a tie here between uh, mushrooms and their, their ability to grow again on dead and decaying things, on, on putrefaction. Um, and he's, he's even going so far as to say that, that, it's, that mushrooms are sort of like, uh, like dead things having been animated, having been reanimated. So this is rather ghoulish, um, rather, uh, rather macabre. And yet, he's not the only one who thought of mushrooms in this particular way. Um, again, going back to Silva Silvarum, the, uh, the book written by Francis Bacon in 1670, he uh, referred to mushrooms in relation to the incubus, the, uh, the, the demonic spirit, and also said that mushrooms grow on dead and rotting trees in the same way that hair and fingernails grow on rotting corpses. Um, <laughs> so it's quite an analogy, uh, a vivid one. 
And also, if we looked at the art historical record, we can also see mushrooms once again in relation to demons, in relation to corpses, and, uh, and, and rot, and also a kind of morality that goes along with that, right? A, um, uh, the, the morality of, of, of hell versus heaven. So if you look here, this is a, this is a scene of, 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 you know, of, of hell, right? This is the, um, the Last Judgment. By, uh, that was a, it's an engraving by Peter Bruegel, the elder. Um, and if you look at the mouth of hell here, in his crown, there are mushrooms right here sprouting out of the top of his crown. Sorry, I, sh I should have given you a, a blown up uh, like version of that so you could see it a little bit better. But um, this again kind of again kind of plays into this idea of, of mushrooms as being these sort of um, it's sort of like uh, you know the keeping company at any rate is mus mushrooms is keeping company with uh, with demonic forces um, and and again with uh, with the dead. Um, and yet, I think there's more to the story than that. <laughs> um, as, and, and there's even more uh, for reasons for why uh, mushrooms have again been cast to the bottom of the Scala Naturae. Um, we've all seen, probably at some point in time, the fairy ring, you know, the, the circle of mushrooms that grows uh, on lawns and in forests. Um, and in modern English, we call them fairy rings, but in past English, uh, they were, our uh, phrase uh, in, in English was, uh, was more um, a witch's circle or the rendezvous of witches. And that corresponds much more closely with other European languages such as Dutch, German, and French, where in Dutch they're, they're called Hexenkringen, which is the witch's circle. And then in German, of course, Hexenkringen, again, witch's circle. And then in, in French, Ronde Saucier, which is also witch's circle. So the... Um, the, uh, the lore that I grew up hearing about, um, about uh, fairy circles or, or witch circles is that you know, if you go into the middle of it, something terrible is going to happen to you. You'll be, you'll be sucked down to hell, or the fairies will arrive and they'll make you dance until you die. Like, there's always something terrible. Did anybody grow up with hearing anything, anything else about fairy circles? <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous, of course, you know, but the idea was that, um, was that, that, that fairy circles marked the, air, or the, the, the circular rings of mushrooms that you see here, um, marked the areas where, uh, where witches had their Sabbath, had their rendezvous with the devil, and would dance in a circle, and then, then after that, that dance, after the, the witch's Sabbath was over, then the mushrooms would come up and marking their footsteps. So again, we see this close connection between, uh, between devilry, witchery, and, uh, and mushrooms. Um, and, and there's also something you know, like interesting happening with Slavic languages, too, because primarily you know, we, we're talking about Western European languages and, and these kinds of uh, linguistic associations here and uh, folkloric associations. But in uh, the Slavic languages, the word for the bolit mushroom, uh, which is the one that this lady is holding here, they can be rather huge. Um, it's called, it's Baba, which is also the word for witch. And there is this um, uh, kind of legendary uh, folkloric figure in, um, you know, like scary stories that are told to kids. And her name is Baba Yaga. And uh, she is this, uh, this witch woman who um, torments children and steals them and all of this. And, and all of the images shown with her, there are always mushrooms all over the place. I have a, a Russian postcard back when you could still get mail from Russia, this was a couple years ago, um, that has, uh, has her house, her, like, her wicked little hut in the forest, and then all of these mushrooms surrounding it. So um, I think that, that also there is a, there is a, a kind of um, a connection between mushrooms and, and women, especially single women, especially women who, are, uh, who, are, who sort of go against the grain for whatever reason, and that this too has added to uh, the, the uh, placement of mushrooms at the bottom of the, of the ladder of being. Can I ask you a question before we change now? Yeah. Did that ring only one type of mushroom that arrives, or is it, can be sorted mushrooms? So one ring is usually one type of mushroom, 
but I have seen, um, I have seen even, even here, like at, at uh, Crabtree Greenway, where the ring is composed of, of one mushroom or one fungus, but then periodically in between, there will be a, a different kind of mushroom. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't form a complete circle, but there will be like little scattered bits here and there. Yeah, have you seen one that, um, is there any particular reason why you asked that? Did, have you well, seen one I that was? Uh, this, this only happens with one type oh, of oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there are several different several different kinds. They're all the um, basidiomycetes, um, basidiomycetic uh, uh, varieties of, of mushroom. But um, but not every mushroom can make a, a perfect circle like that. But yeah. And sometimes they're they're not exactly a perfect circle. But it's amazing how often they are. Like it seems like you could almost you know take a compass and, and draw around them. All right. Anybody else? While we're stopped, anybody else have any questions? All right, so in closing, we'll move away from the mystery. Um, I still don't know that the mystery is completely solved yet, but at any rate, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the, the magic part. So um, this is, I, I had to include this uh, short video, it's only two minutes long, um, because there, if I tried to explain this to you, there's no possible way that you would believe me. Um, so, <laughs> all right, so I, I don't know about you all, but like, I mean, we're entering the holiday season and, you know, a lot of people have a lot of holiday spirit, but for me, the commercialism of it really detracts from the magic. So I want to try to get back to the, the magic of the, of the holiday season. Okay, so the moral of the story is that um, there is a hypothesis. Oh, no, we're not showing up here. It, it sometimes it takes. Okay. okay. So there is a hypothesis that um, the a lot of the, the folklore <coughs> surrounding Santa Claus um, actually originates with the circumpolar um, uh, religious figure of the shaman. So I have to sort of explain while we're waiting for this to come up that um, that the shaman, uh, we often use the word shaman sort of for any non-Western religious practitioner, but that's, uh, you know, an anthropologist would say that that's inaccurate and um, uh, sort of prejudicial in a way because uh, shamans are very specific, again, to the, that circumpolar region. But one thing, that, and even though there are various, you know, uh, religious practices in Siberia versus in, in Alaska uh, versus in, in Finland, like we saw with the Sami, um, they have certain traits in common, and one of the traits that they have in common is the importance of fly agaric to, uh, to rituals, um, and also the importance of, of reindeer. So in Siberia, it's, it, it, and in Finland, for example, thank you so much, uh, it's, it's reindeer, right? In, in Alaska, in Canada, it's obviously caribou, right? But a lot of the, a lot of the, same, um, the same practices and the same symbolisms are in place. So, there is this hypothesis that, uh, that Santa Claus with uh, you know, the, the red and white, um, with the beard, the long white beard, uh, with the flying reindeer, uh, which you just saw that the reindeer also like to consume fly agaric. Um, I don't know if it's really for ritual purposes for them as it is for humans, but we'll leave that to the anthropologist. Um, that, that this, sort of explains the bizarre nature of the Santa Claus myth in our contemporary culture. And it, it, it may sound like a bit of a stretch at first, but then when you look back at even like Victorian Christmas cards from Northern Europe, uh, from Germany, the Netherlands, from uh, Denmark, um, and of course Scandinavia, um, you see that the fly agaric features heavily in a lot of the imagery um, uh, around Christmas. So it does seem that there's, that there's something there. And uh, I mean, still to this day, like I said, I, I lived in, in, uh, in Belgium for, for six years. I got my PhD there. And um, uh, like the most popular Christmas ornaments are, are fly agarics, like still to this day. Mm -hmm. It's a little shiny, little shiny mushrooms. And sometimes there's a, a bearded gnome, a white bearded gnome who looks a lot like Santa Claus. Um, uh, who is also like seated on top of the fly agaric, or, or in some cases like these, actually is the fly agaric, right? The, the, the gnome and the, um, the, the, the man, the bearded man, and the mushroom are, are the same. 
So there's also a kind of interesting um, parallel here when we think about, about the date of Christmas and the fact that um, uh, like when these mushrooms grow and uh, where they grow especially. So um, I think we probably all know that like the, uh, the idea that Jesus was born on, on December 25th actually it's a sort of, has a sort of convoluted history and involves the Roman sun god um, Sol, Sol Invictus, like the, the uh, invincible sun. And uh, his birthday, Sol Invictus' birthday, was, um, was also on December 25th, thereabouts, um, because December 21st is the first day of winter, right? It's the winter solstice, but it's also the point in the year where the, the shortest day of the year is, right? And in the days following the winter solstice, the days get longer. And of course, for the Romans, that meant that the sun god was regaining strength and that he was growing stronger and stronger, right? And so um, the birth of Christ, right, with the arrival of Christianity in the Roman Empire, the birth of Christ and the, uh, the birth of the Roman sun god were sort of conflated. And so you have this, this uh, agreed upon date of December 25th as, uh, as the birth of Christ. Um, this, um, this holiday, of the, or this festivity of the winter solstice also, um, you know, was something that was celebrated all over the world, really. Um, and especially for people living in the far north where that, those longer days meant, were hugely significant, right? Like having um, the sun actually come back after periods of, of extreme darkness was really important and uh, had, a, had a huge social, um, had a huge social significance too, right? And so shamans would actually um, gather um, the, the fly agarics that were, that were growing still under pine trees especially, and um, would drop them down the, the chimneys of yurts um, on, the, on these special days. So you have this sort of delivery of gifts um, through the chimney, uh, you know, to, uh, to sort of like liven up the spirits um, of the people who had, who had been enduring you know, these very long periods of darkness. So, um, so there's another kind of resonance there, um, and the whole idea of the Christmas tree as having gifts underneath it, and like I said, the, um, the uh, fly agaric is one of those mushrooms that um, actually aids in the, well, it really doesn't aid it, it enables, it facilitates the growth of, um, of pine forest and uh, fir and spruce and all of these uh, coniferous trees that we, that we now use as Christmas trees. So you can imagine going into the woods, and in fact you can do it here, um, as well, go into the woods and you can, you know, underneath pine trees, um, you will oftentimes see fly agarics growing underneath them. So there you have your little, your nice little gifts of the uh, supernatural visions and hallucinations right underneath the, uh, right underneath the tree. All right, so I hope that puts everyone in the mood for a uh, happy Christmas. And uh, the, uh, so here's, here I just have a couple of like of short, um, things to say, and then we'll do something again, kind of interactive. Um, but this is actually our local variation of the fly agaric. So we do actually have the Amanita muscaria fly agaric uh, that grows here, but more commonly, we have a, a variation of that mushroom which has all of the same properties, which is called Am Amanita perzicina, uh, the peach agaric, which is appropriate, right, for South Carolina and peaches. You like, yeah. So you can see the color is a little bit different. Um, but this one is growing up, uh, up in Conway, um, and here's a, a little baby one. So you can see the color is a little bit different, but it also is growing up from that um, that vulvic sac. And as it gets older and spreads out, all of those little speckles will become the, the characteristic dots, but it has more of a peach orange color rather than that bright vibrant red. Is that poison? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, eat that and you'll be shot to the moon along with Santa's reindeer. <laughs> But if you want to try, I brought some. <laughs> <laughs> so here are a couple, and I only collect the ones that have already been knocked over by deer. Um, you know, but, the, uh, but here are a bunch of uh, caps and stems of the, uh, the peach variety. I wouldn't encourage you to eat them, but you can smell them. You said they were knocked over by deer. Are the deer eating them? <laughs> I haven't seen that. <laughs> I guess it wouldn't surprise me after Don't seeing the reindeer. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. So does the color tell you whether it's good to eat or not? Color is the least reliable property 
uh, for mushroom identification. That's what I always do. Yeah. The red ones you do not touch. Yeah, I would avoid all the red ones. Um, also avoid anything that's growing from a sack like that because the all those bees are, you know, like if you ate them, you would you would throw up. You would have violent, you would have violent stomach upset, and then before the hallucination set in. But um, their close relatives, um, are, you know, will will kill you straight up. So you really have to be careful. And so the guidebooks always recommend it. And there are a couple of the amanitas that are actually perfectly edible. But the guidebooks will always tell you that if it's, grow if it's growing from a sack and has gills and, and, a, and a ring around the stipe, avoid it altogether. It is because um, of the, the deadly, uh, the deadly look like look alikes. So. Um, so yeah, the last thing that I, that I have for you guys is um, <laughs> this is okay. Uh, is first of all, thank you very much for for your attention. Um, but I. Also, among the other properties that mushrooms have is that they also produce ink. So, in addition to having culinary value, an aesthetic value, an ecological value, and medicinal value, they also have artistic value. Um, so, if anybody wants to give it a shot, um, this is a, a drawing that I made of some octopus trees down at Huntington Beach State Park. But this is um, ink that um, that I derived from these dried mushrooms, most, most of which are bolides, but it's kind of a mixed bag. But they're all edible. There's nothing poisonous in here. Um, and then just let them soak and then got the ink. So um, if anybody wants to give it a shot, I brought a couple brushes and some watercolor paper. So if anybody's feeling adventurous, then uh, I'll just set it up over here. Um, otherwise, I'm willing to answer or attempt at least to answer any questions that you might have. In the mulch that we got around our property, we have something I call the place keys. Oh yeah. Real long and kind of half on the top. Yeah. And it throws up all the spores that land on my siding, which is really bad. Okay. What the heck is that? Um, it sounds like phallus and cuticus. So you identified it as looking like a penis, and so that's so did Carl Linnaeus because that's his uh, taxonomical name, Phallus and Cuticus. So is it in the is it in the tree when they ground it up, or is it in the ground? It's in the ground, yeah. And it's so because the, the organism itself is always underground, right? Um, and so it probably what has and the same thing happened with that that um, I can't remember. Called, but it's a, it's a it's a relative of the Phallus and that uh, that red soccer ball looking honeycomb thing. So that is dangerous to handle as well. No, it's not. In fact, it's uh, it's collected in Europe as a um, for medicinal properties uh, related to um, to the libido and sex drive. Sure, we shouldn't. Do that. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, I would not recommend it. Um, but uh, yeah, the. Um, that one is, is not dangerous, but it might have, a, it might have an odor, like a sticky kind of gelatinous. So yeah, um, but the same thing happened happened with us. We had a tree that was ground up, and then that's when those those uh, stinky <laughs> stinky weird things, red things, came up. And it's just it just has to do with the, the like the change of the pH balance. So a lot of times the fungi will just will be underground, and they'll just be dormant, and then there will be some shift. Um, it could be it could be something minor, like the introduction of a, of a new dog, and that dog's urine sparks something in that fungus, and then they and then they fruit. Yeah. Um, in our case, it sounds like it was the grinding up of those trees that mixed the soil in just a way that changed the pH balance or, or something else, um, gave it an additional nutrients or something like that, and then all of a sudden it had the energy to send up a, a fruiting body. So if I don't pull those out of my mulch, would they keep reproducing? Uh, they probably will, yeah. Um, but, I mean, with our, in our case, you know, we just kind of let them die out, and we haven't had any issues for the last year or two, I think. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't see them necessarily as a, as a problem, as a, as a pest. So would it have a lot of people walking by the front of your house and hear these? And then you add the odor on top of it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but they are, and they are, um, I forget exactly um, what, because the, they
they are, you know, like part of the, you know, the mycelial network. They're not, they're not, um, uh, like they're good ones. They're, they're, they're not parasitic or anything like that. So you don't have to worry about them infecting your trees or anything like that. Just annoying your neighbors, getting a bad reputation. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else have any questions? Does anybody want to try the mushrooming? Okay, I think you were. Right. Have they done studies like trees with and without mushrooms, like the, the difference in the growth rate and the health? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I don't know if there have been any kind of controlled studies like that. Um, I suppose that in theory you could do something like that in a like in a greenhouse mm -hmm. setting maybe or something. Um, but with um, areas that have been heavily deforested, like in the Pacific Northwest, um, they're, uh, they're you know, these, these sort of blasted landscapes. There's an anthropologist, Anna, uh, Anna Lohenkopf Singh, and I think she's at Santa Barbara. Um, but uh, she wrote a book called The um, what is it called? The Last Mushroom in the World or something like that. But she, she writes about these, you know, these heavily deforested areas in, uh, in Washington State, Oregon, uh, British Columbia. And the, uh, I mean, there, there are like no trees anymore at all. These are like old growth forests that have just been raised. And um, the things that come up first that sort of signal the arrival of new growth are mitake mushrooms. So um, they seem to, seem to thrive on this devastation, but they're also the things that rejuvenate the entire forest ecosystem. So I guess it, you know from what from what we do know, and then you know as as you know, mycology is a very new science, um, just in general. So there's a lot about mushrooms that we just that we're just now learning. Um, but it, it's, it seems that um, those those mycelial networks are really fundamental for the health of the forest. And what does the uh, current research say about the therapeutic value for treatment of say uh, chemical dependency or mental illness? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, and I think um, the, uh, the lady here mentioned uh, psilocybin when we were doing our brainstorming session at the beginning. And, you know, right now, from what I know, um, you know, things like, uh, things like psilocybin are, are still being recommended for, for people with certain situations like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, like uh, war veterans, um, people with dependencies who can take small, like modest doses. No, we're not talking about micro doses, but modest doses of psilocybin, and um, and you know, experience a kind of reset. And, uh, and it, it also apparently works for people with severe depression and anxiety too. So again, there's a lot more to be done, and especially if these drugs are going to be, you know, declassified as illegal, you know, from the uh, is it the USDA or the FDA, I guess it's the FDA who, uh, who makes those classifications. But um, so yeah, we're gonna need a lot more evidence, I think, to convince the government that these are legitimate treatments um, and make it more mainstream and, and available. But, like the mushrooms that I passed around, those are not those are not illegal. Um, but there are you know things like psilocybin are actually classified as, mm -hmm. as uh, they're probably misclassified. In fact, I write about. Um, but yeah, right now the research suggests very promising things for, uh, for psilocybin as treatments for a lot of these disorders. I think there was someone, was it, did you have your you have a question? So mine's pretty, uh, pretty You can buy bags of stuff at Trubu called mushroom compost. Can you grow mushrooms in your garden to enhance the soil? Yes. Um, but you'd have to look into exactly which ones would would grow in that particular soil, um, because you know, like they, they require nutrients as well, right? So they'll take nutrients out, but they might you know metabolize other things and, and put them back in. So you have to do a little bit of research um, as to which ones, what, what your soil type is, and which one would be best, which types of mushrooms would be best for that soil type. That's a good question. It's something that I need to look into. For for my own garden as well. Most of our soil isn't soil, it's sand. Yeah, and we have clay on the other side of the river. It's, been, it's a similar problem where just nothing wants to grow. That's why you have a raised bed like I have. 
I have a great garden every year. I think it might come to that for us next year. Any other questions? I was going to, to kind of pose uh, the question or the, the issue that Jeremy, that you put into Jeremy's mouth. <laughs> what, do you, on, on any level, what, what do you think, uh, in your opinion, what are mushrooms after? What you said, you know, Jeremy was, was suspicious yeah. of what mushrooms were after, and I kind of get that feeling too. But what, what do you, I mean, what are they after? Can you just speculate on that? Well, I, I, it's hard to you know to paint with a broad brush in this um, with this case because you know again there there's so there are so many different types and they all have their own kind of their own kind of personalities like their own their own agenda and so one mushroom might be after something completely different than the one next to it um, but there is um, a, a startling amount of evidence that suggests that they are sentient. It's not going to be the same way as humans are sentient, or even dogs or cats or horses, but that they they sort of you know respond to stimuli, and it's not just mushrooms too, but also even things like like viruses, um, things like uh, slime molds. You know, slime molds and and, and uh, mycelial networks can both sort of solve problems in ways that we never even imagined. You know, before um, viruses sort of you know communicate and like team up together, like they have this sort of camaraderie um, that, uh, that is just really kind of mind-blowing to, to think about. So yeah, I, mean, I, would, I would say that they each have their own little projects that they're working on. And that changes, it's like, it's like ours do. Anything else? Well, thank you all so much for being such a wonderful audience. And